Hey, Bethany, you asked me about my last meal on Earth, which, as everybody remembers, was steak and potatoes. But I want to know what you think food's going to be like in heaven. You know, I hope it knocks my taste buds out of the park. (laughs) I really do imagine it being like a long table and all of us just like on either side around with like piles of the most fresh fruit and vegetables. I don't know. That's just the picture that comes to mind. Just like, oh, quenches that desire. I don't know. Is that what comes to your mind? Yeah, I imagine that long table too. And I just think it's piled. I I don't think it's one kind of food. I think it's just (laughs) piles of different things and taste experiences. I think it's just going to be more than we could probably imagine. Welcome to the Deep Well with Aaron Davis. I know a lot of us will approach food with a whole new perspective after listening to this series. On this episode, Aaron will explain why we can look forward to a feast in the future like we've never experienced before. Well, I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one who wears stretchy pants on Thanksgiving in anticipation of all the food we're going to eat, right? And what's interesting is even that silly habit can speak some truth to our hearts about something deeper we see in God's Word. In this episode, I want to jump right into our Bibles, and we're going to start with Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Let me set the stage. The Apostle John wrote these words because God gave him a really dramatic and detailed vision, which became the book of Revelation, starting in verse 1. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Verse 2, for his judgments are true and just, for he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Verse 3, Once more, they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen! Hallelujah! And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you, his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Now, I know that our brains are probably struggling to absorb everything that's going on in these just first few verses. There's a voice of the great multitude, and what they're doing is praising God. Over and over, they're saying, hallelujah. They're declaring that Jesus is worthy of praise. And then there's those 24 elders and those strange creatures, and they're falling down in worship. And there's a voice booming from heaven, and he's giving this rally cry. Praise God, all of us, all walks of life, big and small. And then that booming voice shouts, it's time to feast. Let me pick it up in verse 6. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of many peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Verse 9, And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Verse 10. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. God is moving time toward the moment described in these verses. The marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, I'm not sure if we will literally feed our glorified bodies or not, but I think we will. Jesus was in a glorified body following his resurrection, and Acts chapter 10, verses 40 through 41, tell us that he ate and drank with people after he was raised. Plus, why would we have a feast if we're not going to eat it? What I know for sure is that when God inspired John to write about life behind the veil in heaven, A feast is the picture he chose. 
once again, as we've seen over and over and in so many other places in your Bible that I haven't taken you to in this series, God uses food to teach us something significant about himself. I want you to try and imagine what it's going to be like when sin has been fully removed from our lives. When sin has been fully removed from our food. I want you to picture this scene that's described here. There's creatures, great and small. And what unifies us is our praise to Jesus, the one true king. I want you to try and imagine what it's going to be like when the voices of the saints, and there's so many of us, and we're so loud that it sounds like Niagara Falls as we declare hallelujah, because our Lord God, the Almighty reigns. What will heaven's food taste like? What will be on the tables of the King of Kings? Now, before you start thinking it's like Chick-fil-A chicken strips, and I'm with you, I adore them. I want you to know that your taste buds cannot begin to conjure up what we will eat at this feast. How do I know that? Well, because 1 Corinthians 2, 9 says, But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. There's a lot I don't know about heaven. When I read these passages, like the one we just read in Revelation, I have a lot more question marks than definite answers. But what I do know is that I've never seen anything like it. I've never heard anything like it. I've never imagined anything like it. And I've never tasted anything like what God has in store for me at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Take a big leap with me. We're going to head from Revelation to Matthew chapter 9. And you might feel a little whiplash as I read this verse to you, but I promise it's going to connect. What was going on here is that some people questioned Jesus about why the Pharisees seemed to fast so often, but Jesus' disciples didn't. Again, looking at the outside, it seemed like the Pharisees got it right. Now, Jesus said something in response that I believe points to this feast in Revelation. Matthew chapter 9, verse 15. And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. While they had Jesus, they didn't need to fast. Remember, they had that beautiful breakfast on the shore with him. They had his physical presence in their lives. He was right there to listen and respond to their needs. But when Jesus was pressed on the rhythms of fasting and feasting among his disciples, he said, once we're separated. Now, they were separated physically, not spiritually. Jesus made the way so that we do not have to be separated from him by sin. But once Jesus ascended and his disciples were there waiting for his return, then they had a reason to fast. And you know what? We're in that same gap between Christ's resurrection and his return. And so, We have reason to fast. And it's only when we are finally and forever united with our groom that fasting will have served its purpose. And it's only then that the true feasting will begin. Pastor David Matthias once said it this way, In fasting, we confess we are not home yet. And remember that we are not homeless In fasting, we cry out to our groom and remember that we have his covenant promises. In fasting, we confess our lack and remember that the one with every resource has pledged his help in his perfect timing. I think few practices remind us how earthbound we really are quicker than fasting. I mean, miss a single meal and it causes a physical reaction. At first, we get hunger. And then our minds start to obsess over food. And if we fast much longer than one meal, our blood sugar is going to drop and our brain's going to get foggy. That doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. I have a friend who started fasting and she said, Aaron, I just don't think it's for me because my brain gets really foggy and I have a hard time thinking 
Does that happen to you? Absolutely it does. Because food feeds my brain. And again, it's such clear evidence of how much I need help. I mean, eight hours have gone by here and I can't think. That's the reality of fasting. Again, that doesn't mean we're doing it wrong. It's that need meter sounding its alarm again. And those physical signals, they are a reminder of a greater reality. What fasting does is it forces our bodies to testify and our hearts to fixate on the fact that it will not always be this way. This world, it's not our home. This body is only temporary. A feast is coming. When the bread of life will be ours to behold and the living water will finally quench our thirst. It's kind of like wearing stretchy pants on Thanksgiving. The scripture's call is to hold life loosely in anticipation of the feast that is to come. And the way I'd like to wrap up this series is by reading those verses from Revelation one more time. And I'd love it if you just got lost in the hope, in the promises that God has for you, and maybe got excited in a way you never have been before for the marriage supper of the Lamb that's coming. Here it is again, Revelation 9. I'm going to start with verse 6. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude. I think we're going to be among that crowd, friends. Like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give Him the glory for the marriage supper of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. Erin, you had a lot of great like Christian talk that, you know, kind of went over some of my head, even though I've been a Christian a long time. Like marriage, you talked a lot about the marriage of the lamb. And I'm like, I know that, but what is this marriage and mm. who is this lamb? Can you unpack a little bit of this marriage? Like, okay, I'm 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 personally married, but what does this marriage in heaven look like? Yeah, well, it flips a little bit because we are the bride of Christ. That's true here in Revelation, and it's mentioned that way elsewhere in Scripture. So you are the bride of Christ, and I am the bride mm-hmm. of Christ. But together, mm-hmm. the church, the sanctified, redeemed church, which is all followers of Jesus throughout all of time, we are the bride of Christ, and the groom is Jesus. So this we're separated from the groom right now in history. We're at that point where we're in the bridal suite, so to speak, and we can't <laughs> wait to see him, and we can't wait to be with him. But there is a moment coming when we will be united to him. And just like our human marriages, Bethany, which are meant to paint a picture of this mm. deeper reality, once we are united with Christ, we will never, ever, ever be separated from him. We will be united to him forever. Man, I got a lump in my throat because I cannot Mm -hmm. wait for that moment. And just like, you know, I don't know what you had at your wedding. We had just like appetizers after the wedding because we had a beach wedding. I think we served like barbecue meatballs. But (laughs) there was food. There was feasting. There was celebration. And even that translates Mm. to glory, to heaven. There will be a marriage. There's a bride. There's a groom. And it tells us in this passage that we wear white clothes just like a bride does that the Lord has cleansed and made holy, made us holy. And there's going to be a feast. And I don't Mm -hmm. think there's going to be barbecue meatballs. I think it'll be (laughs) more spectacular than that. You know, we had breakfast for dinner at my wedding. We had a whole breakfast feast. So I'm kind of hoping it's, you know, bacon and eggs and yeah, I some go waffles. For that. <laughs> I think you're going to get a slice of the wedding cake at this wedding. And if you don't know what I'm talking <laughs> yes. about, you have to listen to the other episodes. But there won't be anybody who doesn't get to feast. Yes. Okay, we may have someone listening who's saying, you know, this has been an incredible series. And I hear you talking about this future hope, but I'm actually not sure if I'm going to be there. Like, mm. I actually, I don't know if I like really know Jesus. And I just don't want us to end without, you know, 
just sharing this hope of Jesus with <laughs> the Deep Well listeners. So can you just oh, give us man. a quick a quick invitation? What does that look like to make sure like we're at this feast? I'm so glad you asked that. There have been so many years of my life and of my Christian walk that I would have listened to this and thought, I don't, I'm not sure I'm invited. I'm not sure I'll be at that wedding. Yes. And I would feel that anxiety. And we're, if you're feeling that you're in good company, the disciples expressed similar things like, ah, I know you're telling me, but I'm not sure I'm going to be there. And it, this is how you are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You tell Jesus in your heart that you believe him, that he is the king, and that you want him to rule your life because you acknowledge you can't rule your life on your own. And that the first step is to confess that, like, I am a sinner. I cannot be who I want to be, who you want me to be. And I need you to forgive me. And then I need you to be in charge. And that's it. You don't even have to say it in those words. I said it. You don't have to close your eyes and fold your hands. I know people have given their lives to Jesus in all manner of different ways, but they acknowledged that Jesus was king. They surrendered themselves to him and asked for his forgiveness. Those are the important steps. And that's it. You're in. You will be at the marriage supper of the lamb. You will be the bride along with Bethany and I and all of the other saints. And it's not an invitation that ever gets revoked. You are his. This is your future reality. It's guaranteed. And you know what? I think Jesus is looking forward to it as much as we are. He's prepared Mm. that feast for us. That moment when the groom is united to his bride is what he's been. It's what he went to the cross for. And so he is longing for it. I am longing for it. I know you are longing for it. And I want you to be there Mm -hmm. so desperately. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds so amazing. And especially in life right now when things can feel very heavy. We're all in different places. Life can feel, you know, great at moments, hard at moments. So how for you, Erin, has this future feast that's to come that is just so amazing and so like it gives us hope for today. How has that changed the way that you live? How has that changed your outlook for, you know, being on this earth when hard still happens? Yeah, well, what's that old hymn about the things of earth growing strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace? And that's what it does. They don't disappear. It's not like I don't have to do laundry anymore because someday I'm going to be at the marriage feast of the lamb. It's not that life doesn't have aches and pains. Of course it does. We've talked about that's a good reason to fast. But they're strangely dim in the light of his glory and his promises. And what I know is I'm going to be at that marriage feast in a second. Maybe not a second like we measure time, but in the scope of time, in the scope of eternity, I'm going to be there really soon. And we're going to have that feast and I'm going to be united with Jesus forever. And the saints are going to be so many and so loud that as we sing, it sounds like peals of many thunder. I mean, we're almost there. It won't be long now. And that gives me fortitude. And it also gives me urgency. Because like you said, Bethany, not everybody is at the feast. And those who are not at the feast are separated from God forever. So In some sense, it's why I teach and it's why I have an urgency about that because I want everybody I know and everybody Mm -hmm. I don't know to be at this table and enjoy this feast. Mm -hmm. You know, when I think of this feast to me, it's, it's really, even on a daily basis, it's what gives me strength and hope because if I don't have like a future, if I don't know really what's to come? Like, what is the point? You know, like, right. what, why am I here? And sometimes I do question that too. Like, well, then why am I here? Why doesn't God just take us all home with him today? I mean, if that's, that's the most amazing thing in the world, but what's the point? So can you help us understand, like, why are we still here? If there's such an amazing thing to come, why doesn't God just take us all home with him and we can start feasting today? Yeah. Well, because not everybody knows. And we know from scripture that it's God's desire that all would give their hearts to him. And so those of us who know him, this is an irreversible promise, but there are lost people and they need to know. And God's heart is that all of his children would be at the feast. You know, it's like Mm. my kids are young, but as I imagine them as young adults and when they have their own families and I've got the table set for some big Christmas dinner and say Judah and his family and his kids aren't there yet. I'm going to be like, wait a minute. Nobody, nobody touch that turkey. Nobody take a drink of anything. We are waiting for Judah. And it's that idea that um, Mm. he he wants us all to be there. God is so gracious. You know, when I think about that, 
because it's like, wow, he doesn't have to. He doesn't have to. He didn't have to send Jesus. He doesn't have to wait, but he desires for us to be with him and to be there. And it gives such purpose, you know, even like as a mom to, you know, share with our kids. And I loved how you talked about, you know, you were fasting for your son and just even, you know, to know Jesus deeper. It's like, wow, we can fast and we can feast, you know, to even celebrate what's to come, but to pray that we would be purposeful and meaningful with our lives and telling other people about Jesus right now. Even, you know, it doesn't have to be that we're missionaries far, far away. We can we can do that right in our own family. So yeah. for the mom who's like, okay, I have a few kids and I want them to know, you know, I want them to be at that feast one day. How can you encourage her to, you know, love and and be purposeful in her home right now? Yeah, I want you to talk about heaven every chance you get with your kids. Mm. I mean, every chance you get. And talk about hell, too. I think that's sometimes when we're like, oh, we we don't want to talk about hell with our kids. That's scary. But they should know the stakes and the reality, not in a way that to frighten them into a commitment with the Lord. But if the Lord talks about it, we should talk about it. That's sort of my parenting Mm -hmm. mantra. But I think my kids would say, we should ask them some season of this podcast or just in general, that their mom talks about heaven a lot. And when I do, it's usually with tears in my eyes. And I just said the other day, guys, I want to be with Jesus. I want to go right now. And one of them was like, well, don't you want to stay with us? And I was like, I love you. I hope I get to watch you become old men. I want to see every moment of your life. But if I have the choice between being here with you and being in glory, I don't have to hesitate. I want to be with Jesus. And it's because they know heaven is this place of feasting. Heaven is this place of glory. Heaven is this place where there's no sin. Heaven is when I get to be with Jesus. So maybe just start there. I mean, read Revelation with your kids. Talk about this marriage supper of the Lamb. You got so many opportunities. I hope you're at the dinner table all the time with your kids. It's just a shadow thing. It points to the greater reality. And you're talking about God being so gracious. How gracious is it that when we are in heaven with him, he's going to give us a feast. Mm. You know, I think about that every year at Thanksgiving, like only a good God on a holiday intended to give him thanks, gives us all this abundance. Yes. And that's what he's going to do in heaven, too. We're going to be there to glorify him, but he's going to give us riches that we can't even imagine. So I just say, make heaven a common conversation at your family Mm, table. mm -hmm. I love that you're really normalizing these conversations about fasting, feasting, and even heaven, because I know for me, it can feel sometimes like, okay, heaven, like just hallelujah, you know, all day. (laughs) And it's like, what am I doing? You know, but you're painting a picture that's just so beautiful. And just the, you know, like we're giving God glory, but there's so much more we're feasting and we're celebrating. And it's just, it's more incredible than anything we could imagine. So sharing that with the people around us and normalizing that conversation and being in revelation and learning just with these passages you shared, I feel like that's a good challenge for all of us. So I think part of that ethereal picture of heaven comes from this idea that we think our bodies are for earth and our bodies aren't for heaven and food is for now and there's no food in heaven. I I don't think that's what we see in scripture at all. Will we have glorified bodies? Yes. What will those be like? I don't know. In my case, it means hopefully free from chronic pain because sin will be removed from the equation, but we're going to eat. So we need to stop pretending that we're going to be these like blobs that sit on clouds and play harps. I mean, we're going to feast. And that, I think, helps all of us recognize, oh, it's not as detached from my current reality as I maybe think it is. I'm so happy I'm not going to be a blob on a cloud. I don't want to be a cloud blob either. (laughs) No, to the the cloud blobs. Okay, you mentioned another thing that uh, if if you've been a Christian or been in church for a while, we hear a lot. You talked about living water. Mm. And some of us may understand what that means, but some may not, because we just hear these Christian terms a lot. But can you just give us a quick you know, unpack that, Aaron 101, living water, what is it? Yeah, I think we can find it in our Old Testament and our New Testament, of course, because they're not separate from each other. They mirror each other. And the story that comes to mind is when Moses was leading the Israelites out of captivity and they were grumbling. First, they were hungry, which I can't believe we didn't talk about the manna in this series. That's a whole nother thing. I think it tasted like graham crackers, by the way. And then they're thirsty. They got food. They need a drink, which Bethany, you can so relate to this with a toddler because they always need food and then they need a drink and then they need something. So they were being toddlers, right? And God said to Moses, strike the rock with your staff and out of it will flow water. And that's exactly what happened where there was just a rock 
suddenly there was life. There was this gush of water. And that is a picture for our hearts. We have hearts of stone. That comes from scripture when we don't know Jesus. And he strikes them with his salvation. And out of us flows this living water, this hope. And Jesus is the living water. He satisfies us with good things. That thirst for salvation, that thirst we made right with God, that thirst for our lives to have meaning, that thirst for joy, that thirst mm-hmm. to belong. He satisfies all of that with himself. So that's all over the place. It's at the woman at the well. And here again in Revelation, that idea that Jesus satisfies us like mm-hmm. water satisfies us when we're really thirsty. Mm-hmm. There's so many things you've mentioned that are like they're on earth, but they point to Jesus, like marriage and feasting and fasting and water. Ding, 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 it's ding. That's the whole Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so how can we feast? We've been talking about fasting and feasting, but let's talk about feasting because that just, you know, it, it's a good note to, <laughs> to talk about and it just feels, you know, better than yeah. fasting. But I want to know, we have this future feast to come. That sounds amazing. How can we feast today in a way that celebrates and reminds us of that that future feast to come? Well, I think as we've talked about feasting all along, the baseline of what I've been trying to communicate is Just acknowledge that your food comes from God and receive it with gratitude. But I think I'd almost flip that script here and just say, absolutely, enjoy your food, receive it with gratitude. I've said all along, that doesn't mean just throw all caution to the wind. But here I'd say even the best meal you've ever had, which we've talked about some of our best meals or our hope filled meals for the best meal, even if, you know, today you make yourself the most perfect ham sandwich of all time. (laughs) Just know it's all a shadow. It's just God saying, wait and see what I have for you. Mm. And take that beyond food. I mean, even if just everything goes great at work today and everything goes great in your relationship today and your body feels great today and you happen to catch an amazing sunset today and it's just one of those perfect days, Mm -hmm. it's a shadow. It's a shadow of all God has for you. And so we don't put our hope in perfect days here. We don't put our hope in perfect food here or perfect bodies here. We put our hope in all that is to come. And we enjoy what we have now. And we just know it really is just the appetizer for the feast. I can't believe it's the last episode of this series. Uh, thanks, Bethany. I have loved having you in the co-host seat. Uh, you have made this so much fun. I wish I could take you out to lunch. That seems like a fitting end to this series on food. I did just one more time want to mention the work that Bethany does through Girl Defined Ministries. They are pointing young women to God's word, and I can't cheer loud enough for that work. Find them at girldefined.com. Yeah. I've loved spending this time with you, too, and I am going to go back to all the previous episodes and re-listen to them, and you can actually do that, too. To hear all the past series of The Deep Well, visit reviveourhearts.com slash thedeepwell. That's actually where you can grab a copy of Aaron's devotional, Fasting and Feasting. This series is over, sadly, but your personal study of food in the Bible can just begin when you get this book. Again, grab a copy at reviveourhearts.com slash thedeepwell. The Deep Well with Erin Davis is a production of Revive Our Hearts, calling women to freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.